Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Strategic Command World War I, a new game out by Fury Software and published by Matrix and Slytherin Games. In this episode, this is episode number three of our Let's Play series on this game, we're playing as the Central Powers, but we are not following the Schlieffen plan. We're actually sort of ad-libbing and going at things a little bit differently. So uh, the German forces have attacked into France. They have taken the key French city just in this last turn of Nancy, which is a French national morale center. The fall of that city will hurt overall French national morale. Uh, but we have not uh, actually uh, attacked through Belgium. So we haven't attacked Belgium. The British are not at war with us uh, at this stage. We're two turns in. It's August 15th. Uh, the attacks in Serbia have gone well. I think we just took Belgrade, and uh, we are holding our own against the Russians on along the Austro-Hungarian border, uh, as well as in eastern Prussia. And so as the leader of Germany, I have dispatched something like four or five corps to the Eastern Front and to the Serbian Front to give a little bit more strength to the Austrians attacking in Serbia and to also uh, give a little bit more strength to the Austrians and Germans defending in Eastern Prussia in the hope that it will save us uh, from a Russian uh, onslaught and perhaps kind of reverse the Schlieffen plan and try and knock the Russians and Serbians out of the war in detail first and then turn on the British and, pro or sorry, the French and then obviously eventually the British. Uh, but that's the situation right now. It is August 15th. The game starts August 1st. Uh, so we are about to conduct the second allied AI turn. And that's really what I've got my finger on the trigger right now. Now, this was taken from a live stream from a couple of days ago. So keep that in mind as you're watching this. I do interact with the audience a little bit. Uh, pretty minimally, but a little bit. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump back in and see what the allies have in store for us as we turn to episode number three of Strategic Command World War One. French morale falls due to the loss of Nancy. Nancy, Nancy, I don't know how you pronounce that word. Serbian morale falls due to the loss of Belgrade. Serbia is moving its capital to Nish, here in the southeast. Baron Konrad von Wagenheim, our ambassador of the Ottoman Empire, reports from Constantinople that the Ottoman army is not yet ready for war and that large sums of money will need to be spent on it to bring it up to an acceptable standard. Improving the Ottoman army will cost 200 MPPs at 50 MPPs a turn for four turns. So basically two months at 50 MPPs over those two months. In return, the Ottomans will be able to provide Lehman von Sanders with the logistical support necessary to take the field. Would you like to provide the funds to improve the Ottoman army? Uh, on the eve of the entering the, uh, the war, the Ottoman government had run out of money with which to pay uh, their men, and two large shipments of gold from Germany played an important role in enticing them to join the Central Powers. Saying yes to this is recommended, as doing so will swing the Ottomans 15-20% to 20 toward the Central Powers. In addition to this, it will lead to Lehman von Sanders deploying at Constantinople as an Ottoman uh, headquarters unit on the 1st of September 1914. Well, a headquarters unit costs more than 200 MPPs, so we're going to do that because that's... You know, it's going to bring the Central Powers more into the uh, sway of the Central Powers to bring them into our alliance, and it will also give us a, a good value on a headquarters unit. Meanwhile, in Austria-Hungary, the Polish Supreme National Committee are offering their services in our fight against Russia. Josef uh, Pilsdwiski is, pro <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. is proposing to raise a Polish legion for service in our army. Given the number of likely Polish volunteers, these volunteers would form a half-strength detachment which could deploy at Kois in early September 1914. Would you like to approve the raising of a Polish unit? It'll cost 30 MPPs for two turns, so 60 MPPs total. Um, did this historically happen? A Supreme National Committee was formed by Polish activists in Krakow in August 1916 to promote their interests within the Empire, and the Habsburg authorities agreed to form a Polish legion to fight uh, to fight for them under the on Poluski's command. He started the war by trying to trigger an uprising in Polish Russia, but the attempt failed. His efforts then turned to raising this legion, and more than 10,000 men were recruited in the first months of the war. The Polish soldiers swore allegiance to Franz Josef and formed part of the Austro-Hungarian army, with, with their unit ultimately reaching a strength of more than 20,000 men. But allowing this unit to be raised, uh, the Austro-Hungarians helped stimulate Polish nationalism and demands for self-determination from the Poles and other nationalities within the Habsburg Empire. This will pose a threat should the war turn out to be much longer than expected. So, essentially, we can either get a cheap unit now, um, or we. Uh, but if the war lasts too long, then we actually help to undermine the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in the long term. So, 
In this case, I'm actually going to say no, because I don't want to stimulate the disintegration of the Empire more than it already will. Uh, so we won't do that. Meanwhile, because of the rapid conquest of Bulgaria, um, or of, uh, Ser of Belgrade, Bulgaria is taking an increasing interest in the events in Serbia. So basically, Romania can get emboldened by Russian success against the Austrians, while the Bulgarians can get emboldened by Austrian successes against the Serbians, and they can actually join the war on the Central Powers side. So if we can get Bulgaria and the Ottomans to join the war, we'll, we'll be able to basically split uh, the Serbians off, uh, potentially, from, uh, from the Russians. Not quite, actually, though, because Romania is there between them. Still, obviously, two more countries joining the war uh, would be incredibly useful. Meanwhile, French and Russian and everybody else's mobilization continues. You can see a large numbers of, n number of troops are being raised near Essen, Dusseldorf, Cologne, Dortmund, uh, to the north of Koblenz. We got a bunch more troops there. The Austro-Hungarians are also mobilizing more troops near Premzel. Two more corps arrive there. And there you have it. So you can see the Germans have 318 positive MPPs. They're getting 30 from Swedish trade, 18 from Norwegian trade, 10 from Denmark. They lose 39 to support Austria-Hungary. 50 are being taken away to deploy uh, uh, Paul von Hindenburg's army. Um, 65 are being added via food supplies because the Netherlands is neutral. And negative 50 are being spent by improving the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So all those event triggers you can see uh, that impact on our balance sheet. Man, I've been talking a long time. I need to take a breather. All right, so the Russians move into Gumbadan. They're threatening to cut our troops in uh, the Baltic states off. French moving a headquarters unit out there, replacing it with a infantry corps. That isolated Austrian corps being attacked a little bit by the Russian troops there. Reinforcements are being deployed in Poland, in Serbia. French uh, destroyers are engaging our submarines here in the East Frisian Islands. Russian armies are advancing near Kovno against our cavalry. Whoa. They just destroyed a cavalry corps. Jesus. That one unit, like, inflicted five casualties against us. That was rough. Meanwhile, this exposed Austrian corps to the south of Koval is getting attacked pretty heavily, too. Russian troops advancing near Chernowitzk are surprised and battered a little bit. And there goes an Austrian corps to the south of Tarnopol. So the Russians really getting in there, uh, sort of in, eastern, in the eastern portion of our border there, Threatening to turn the flank on our entire defensive line in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's a little bit concerning. Quite a few troops over here. We've got the uh, the German Cavalry Corps that just arrived, and the two newly raised uh, Austrian Infantry Corps should help to stem the tide a little bit. But they kind of need to deploy to the north here, north of Lemberg, because there's more additional Russian troops deploying there. We also lost a German cavalry corps in eastern Prussia. Looks like a Serbian headquarters unit is deploying. French mobilization and Russian mobilization continue. Additional German troops deploying south of Mannheim. A bunch of Russian troops showing up in Poland. Our raiders are disrupting the Serbian convoys. So we lost a cavalry corps and an Austrian infantry corps. Still, the French lost more than three infantry corps just by themselves last turn, and the Russians lost some pretty heavy casualties, too. Uh, it is now August 29th. The Entente's naval blockade of Germany. The enemy may launch a naval blockade to stop neutral shipping bringing goods to our shores. If we do not engage the enemy fleets carrying out such a blockade, then our people will go hungry, and this could lead to disorder as their morale falls. There are two areas where the enemy can place ships to enforce the blockades. The most effective is between Scapa Flow up here in Norway. This is the northern blockade objective. Um, they can also enforce a blockade between Scotland and Iceland, but this is less harmful to us because it is easier for our merchantmen to slip through their patrols in this area. Notice placing minefields on our own naval forces on these locations is not recommended, as it will also impede the flow of merchantmen and therefore reduce national morale. That's another thing that's new in this game is mines. You can lay minefields, which I 
don't really know how to do yet. But basically this blockade, if enemy ships are deployed along this blockade route, we lose national morale. Um, and over time, uh, it will uh, really hurt us. The other blockade route is over here. This is a, a more near uh, distant blockade route. You can see it is a much longer blockade route. And it is also, um, you need you know, you need a lot more naval units there. Uh, and, uh, and naval units can slip through. Meanwhile, the Germans can deploy submarines or other units along these objectives here to hurt British supplies. Although I'm assuming that could also hurt relations with the with the Americans as well if they deploy units here and unrestricted submarine warfare etc okay so our troops have advanced south of Verdun we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna entrench these troops here so we're gonna right click we're gonna go ahead and entrench we're gonna entrench on three sides and I think we're gonna entrench like this so we're entrenched against these three hexes the troops at Nancy are also going to go ahead and entrench Three sides as well, because why not? It'll help protect their flank in the event the Germans, the Allies, do break through. Meanwhile, these troops are going to advance here to take the, the ground that uh, the enemy unit was destroyed in last turn. I kind of want to destroy another French Corps if I can. Looks like we could. So we're going to go ahead and use our artillery here at Strasbourg to bombard this French unit here. It'll drop their morale. We can actually bombard them twice. Oh, we have up to three shells. I'm not sure what... It looks like it has a slight impact on their morale and readiness as we continue to bombard them. But I'm assuming I only have, you know, I only have those three shells. I'm guessing I get one shell per turn or something to that effect. All right, so these guys can do one to three damage. One to three damage. Although that was more like one to two. One to four. Uh, and there you go. We just destroyed that enemy unit. Okay. So we can't move in there with a level 9 unit, unfortunately. We can only move in here with a level 7 unit, but we'll do it anyway. So we'll expand the front there. These troops didn't actually attack, so they can entrench as well on three sides. So we're building a trench line here south of Verdun to the east to defend against uh, French counterattacks. Kind of means I'm giving up the initiative on the offensive. going to be these three hexes. Yep. So there's two units here, level seven units that are not dug in, but the rest of these guys are all dug in and, uh, and hopefully will be much more difficult for the French to attack. Okay. So these of these new troops, we're going to deploy a bunch of them to the east. Let's actually go ahead and reinforce these troops that lost casualties over the pre previous few turns. We're going to lose a lot of experience in these units. So you saw it was a one-star unit. Now it lost a majority of that experience, lost over 60% of its experience. So some of these initial units that actually you start the war with are considered... Perf I'm assuming the reason you start them with one in experience star is you're assuming they're professional soldiers. And so they're, they're more ready for combat than... Um, you know, uh, newly raised troops. Although even some of these guys are coming in with like half stars, etc. Um, this guy's a full Iron Cross star. We're going to lose 10 experience there. We'll lose three here. But again, reinforcing these guys, I think, is the right, the right strategy. So we've strengthened our defensive line here against France. I think sufficiently so that we can hold this position. You can see we are a fair bit into the French lines. We've taken uh, Nancy. We've driven south of Verdun. This is historically about as far as the Germans got in this part of France. You can see we've got a nice chunk of two, four, six, eight, nine hexes inside France with no hexes inside ours. So we've taken a bit of a chunk of France. Uh, we're not yet at war with the British. Um, and, uh, and that's the situation right now. Uh, so let's move south uh, to deal with the Serbians here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and attack these guys that are dug in. These German troops will attack and break through the Serbian lines there. So 
So, we're going to attack these guys at, what is the city even? Yuzo? I can't, like, Yuzik? So we went ahead and attacked there. Let's swap these troops around. So we'll do two to two here. Two to one. All right. Okay, so another Serbian core is destroyed and another Serbian city is taken. We'll have the Germans attack at Krajevic. To no effect. These guys have moved down there. Alright, two to two. I mean, I will gladly take more casualties. Oh no, enemy contact! Oh wait, that's a headquarters unit? I'm not too scared of that. Wait, what is this? This is Montenegro and this is Serbia. Interesting. So there's Montenegrin forces as well. Um, I'm more than happy to take some additional casualties if it means knocking the, uh, the Serbians out of the war more quickly. Okay, so we have effectively broken the, the Serbian line here. We destroyed two infantry units here, and we damaged a third over here. We have lost pretty heavy casualties, but the Serbians appear to be down to a single infantry corps here near Nish that we can see anyway. Um, our headquarters unit will advance to the front to Belgrade. The other headquarters unit will stay back at Sarajevo. Uh, we're also cutting the supplies to the Serbians here uh, through their Montenegrin port. Uh, down near Senje, or however you pronounce that. We have units that are just a hex or so away from Nish. Now Nish is their capital. This garrison unit may get counterattacked and overwhelmed, but the hope is that they're going to be forced to pull these headquarters units back, which is going to further expose their positions over here. And so I'm hoping that in early September to mid, mid to late September, we might be able to take Nish and then uh, drive on the last capital here, which is an alternate secondary at Yuskup. Um, and, and knock the Serbians out of the war before the winter of 1915. That's the objective anyway. With that being said, I think with these additional German corps, we probably have sufficient troops in the region to accomplish our goal. Um, so we can probably shift any additional German reserves uh, against the Russian uh, front in Austria-Hungary. We're going to spend some Austro-Hungarian points on reinforcing some troops. We're going to have these guys actually fall back. Well, let's go after the Russian troops at Tarnopol. So we just destroyed a Russian corps at Tarnopol. Uh, where do we want to send these corps? We'll attack these Russian troops here. Have these guys fall back toward Primzel. Move this core forward. Almost destroyed that guy. Alright, we'll destroy this core here. these troops toward Ivan Ivangrod here. There's a bit of a gap just north of, of Premzil. We'll move our headquarter unit over here. So we destroyed two Russian corps here uh, along the Austrian front. This cavalry hopefully will delay the enemy a little bit. We'll have this German cavalry attack this Russian infantry corps. It inflicts two casualties. It does lose one itself, but then it falls back a little bit. The troops at Chernowitz and the cavalry here to the west have reinforced. Hopefully they don't get attacked because their morale and readiness is very low. Actually, to that, to that effect, I'm going to move the German cavalry up ahead to take, take the brunt of any attack. We'll have the cavalry at Krakow reinforce. 
Austrian cavalry will move in here at least to scout out the Russian positions in Poland. Ooh, zero to five. I'm going to do that every day of the week. So we just knocked out a Russian cavalry court. Could no. Crippled a Russian garrison over that way. I don't want to attack Lutz, though, with the cavalry by itself. It looks like they would not fare well. So we're going to go ahead and move these guys east. So the German offensive in Poland toward Warsaw has a bit of success this turn. I'm not going to attack that core. All right, so we're doing that. Meanwhile, we did lose the cavalry unit near Gumdabin, or however you pronounce that. We'll move our infantry north here to counterattack the Russians in that area. We'll destroy that Russian infantry corps here that was in the city, and we'll retake the city. We'll also move one infantry corps... Core, Korth. One infantry core. Can we move these guys to Riga? Two to two. More like one to two. Alright, so we're beginning the offensive on Riga as well, although we are pretty exposed here. Our flank is is very much in the air. We've got one core back in the rear at Matau, but we probably should bring reinforcements into Cheville to protect the flank and our rail line north toward our forces near Riga. We've reduced Riga's troops down to level 7. We've also gotten rid of all their entrenchment. Uh, their port is down to level 10. They did pull that one badly damaged destroyer back, but they brought another destroyer in, which is a level 10 destroyer. I'd really like to sink that thing. So we'll see if we can. We're losing quite a bit of casualties with our naval units here. And our cruisers are completely worthless here against these Russian destroyers. So again, we nearly beat them, but we run out of attacks with one hit point left. Damn it. Did we actually, maybe we destroyed it. If we take a look at the reports, take a look at the losses, uh, detailed losses. The Russians have already lost four cores. Dark Mending, thanks for the follow. Appreciated. Um, I don't see any naval assets destroyed by anyone yet. Meanwhile, our naval assets in, in the Gulf of Riga actually are pretty battered here. You can see worn down quite a bit. All right, so we have two naval vessels. I'm hoping that drops their supply from nine to seven. I'm curious if aerial bombardment does anything to entrenchments. Nope. All right, so that's it for Eastern Prussia and for Austria. I think because of what we've discovered, we're gonna go ahead and rail some troops east. So we're gonna put some at Allenstein here. We're also gonna put a core at Konigsberg. I mean, they're probably going to go for Johann Johannesburg. But if they do, my troops, if they're fresh off the train, are going to be a little bit exposed. And that makes them much less effective fighters. So we're moving these guys to where there already are armies. So they should get incorporated into the armies there. We've got enough to move one more army core. We're going to move these guys to Stanislaw. 
on the Austrian front. I don't have enough to move any of the other troops. We probably want to keep some of these newly raised troops in the east also, just in the event that uh, the British go to war. I don't really know if aircraft are worth anything at this point. All right, move them to Aachen. Uh, order a hit on Admiral Tortugov? Maybe. Maybe we should. Make sure to liberate Finland. I move Finland, they're part of Russia right now? Sorry, Finland. I guess I could land troops in Helsinki. I wonder what the Marines are worth. Like, what are they for? I can, I can operate the Marines. They're cheap to operate. I don't know how strong they are. Marines. Soft attack, 4, 3, 5, 5. Defense, 3, 2. 4, 3, 5, 5, 3, 2. How does it compare to an infantry corps? 5, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3. So regular infantry, much better in battle. How does it compare to the Austrians? Well, the Austrian infantry is about the same. Interesting. I mean, we could send these Marines somewhere. Working against, like, garrison units or detachments or something like that. You know what? We're going to send them over to Ragusau. Just to make sure that they don't drive into into Bosnia. So the German Marines are deploying over that way. Meanwhile, the Austrians are going to go ahead and spend what little points they have left, bringing this cruiser almost up to strength. The Germans only have one point left. The, Austri the Ottomans have 43. And we're about to move into September, still not yet at war, with the British. So we'll see if the British do declare war on us or not. Uh, MPPs carry over. But I think you lose some. I think there's like an efficiency penalty or something like that. We could march the cavalry manually. They'd lose a lot of morale, but they could ride. Save some money. Probably take about a month to get to the front. They'd actually be right at the front immediately in the east. Let's do that. They're going to ride over this way. They're going to lose a lot of their morale. They're going to lose 70% morale and a big chunk of their effectiveness, but they just rode across Germany. The ride of the German Lancers across Germany to the Russian front to save the day. All right. So I think that's going to do it, and we're going to move into September. But with that being said, let's go ahead and jump back in here and uh, cut this one off. We'll wrap this episode up. Episode number three of Strategic Command, World War I. Uh, the war in the West is continuing to sort of maintain its tepid pace. Uh, individual attacks here and there. We've destroyed a fair number of French units despite the lack of uh, a Schlieffen-type uh, attack. Uh, but really the focus has been on Serbia and on Russia. Our offensive in Serbia is losing steam. The units there are exhausted and battle-worn and really fought out. Uh, we really need a little bit of a pause there uh, to regain the initiative as we start to head toward winter. Meanwhile, the front in Austria is looking better than ever. The Austrians really are not in any danger at all. Uh, the drive on Riga is underway with the city actually being encircled and under siege, and hopefully that will fall in the next day or so. Uh, but with that all being said, we're about to jump into the next turn. We're about to jump into the month of September, and I think this is as good a point as any to jump in and cut this one off. So I hope you guys are enjoying the series. Please, as always, let me know your thoughts below, and until next time, as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.